Hello, and welcome to the Empowered Wife Podcast, where it's all about fixing your relationship without your man's conscious effort so that you feel desired, taken care of, and special. Even if your relationship feels completely hopeless. I'm Laura Doyle, and today we're talking about how to get your husband to listen. I'm going to share four ways to speak the language husbands like and understand. My guest Sue was just starting her third marriage when she realized they were fighting all the time and her husband wasn't really in. Marriage counseling didn't help until the counselor gave her a post-it note with a clue on it. Today, her marriage is loving, respectful, intimate, comfortable, and optimistic. She's going to tell us how she created that. And then I'll be giving out the award for the worst relationship advice of the week, which is so popular that it's become part of the language. So it sounds really, really true, but didn't work for me. Didn't work for the listener who sent it in. It's probably not working for you either. All that is coming up. But first, let's talk about four ways to get your husband to listen. Having the same conversation again and again, the one that turns into an argument or a cold war every time gets old fast. But when your husband isn't holding up his end of the parenting, finances, or the household maintenance, you end up stuck holding the bag, which is exhausting. And you're likely to get resentful if you don't say something. But what if he gets irritable whenever you mention a particular topic? Or what if every time you bring it up, it isn't a good time? What if he just won't listen? If he'll never talk about it, how will things ever get better? It can make you feel hopeless. Here are four secrets to talking so he can hear you. One, appreciate something he's already doing. Husbands crave appreciation. Actually, we all do, but husbands are part of all of us. One man told me his wife complained that he woke her up by munching on potato chips in the car while he drove the family back from a long weekend in the mountains. I thought I was doing a good thing, taking the family on vacation and driving everybody back while they rested, he said, but I didn't feel appreciated. She only noticed that I eat chips too loudly. Another husband told me recently that he used to clean the kitchen, but he stopped because his wife never acknowledged that he did it. She never said anything, so it was like it never happened. You might be thinking, well, I clean the kitchen every day. No one thanks me either. You'd probably like someone to notice and acknowledge your efforts too, right? It's only human. To have a culture of gratitude in your marriage, why not go first? You can thank him for ordinary things like making the coffee, putting the kids to bed, or putting on a new roll of paper towels. And for big things like supporting the family or his character traits like being fun-loving and generous. When he feels appreciated, he feels successful in being your hero, which inspires him to want to listen to you because what you're saying makes him feel good. As one guy on the man panel at the Cherish for Life weekend put it, my wife was so grateful that I fixed the cabinet that I started thinking, what else can I break around here so I can fix that too? Of course, you don't have to say thank you to him to make him listen, but when you want him to be open, that's a great time to look around appreciatively at what you already have, thanks to him. Number two, ask to borrow his brain. Announcing that you want to talk is the same as saying, You're in trouble, and I want to complain and criticize you. There's a conversation nobody wants to have. Most husbands will climb out the window or disappear into the floor to avoid that conversation. And if you're anything like me, you're thinking, but he's not in trouble. I just want to discuss the budget and how we're not banking any money for a vacation. But right there, hidden in your agenda, is a complaint. You spend too much, you don't save enough, you don't make enough. And your husband, he's highly sensitive that you think he's falling short. Your disappointment in him is pretty crushing, actually. At least it was for my husband and for every man I've ever spoken to about this. Looking back, I can see why my husband retreated to the TV so he didn't have to continuously be reminded about how he wasn't making me happy. From his standpoint, he was already doing his best, so my complaining didn't motivate him to improve or to listen to me at all. He avoided the pain of that conversation completely. But if you figure out what it is you want and ask if you can borrow his brain about something, you can engage him in solving your problem, which he loves to do. For example, you could say, can I borrow your brain? I want to figure out a pretty backdrop for my next video. And I'm stuck. Any ideas? 
I said that recently, and we started shooting a video right away with a great new set design that he came up with. Number three, express a desire, not a complaint. Husbands can't even hear you when you're complaining. I know this from my own experience of complaining for years and having my husband tune me out. I thought I was saying what I wanted, but I was actually saying what I didn't want, which is the definition of complaining. He just didn't know what to do for me. He didn't know what I wanted. For example, in the old days, I would have said how boring the plain old walls look as a backdrop for my videos. He might listen politely, but he wouldn't know what to do for me. He might think I needed a nap. Double check to make sure you're expressing a pure desire, meaning no manipulation, control, or complaint when you talk to your husband. Just just think of the final outcome you want. Stick to that. It's so easy for complaints to sneak in. That happens to me sometimes too. I was tempted to say, I'm sick of these plain old walls as a backdrop for my videos, but I can't use the windows because I look dark when I'm backlit. So, ah, there's no indication of what I wanted in that, which is the critical information my husband needs in order to make me happy. So if your husband is anything like mine, that kind of complaint will only have him tune you out again. So I just said it to myself and I figured out what I wanted before I spoke to him. It's not fun to listen to complaining to begin with, but when he can't figure out how to help you, he isn't likely to tilt his head and say, tell me more. More likely he'll search for something more interesting to listen to, like the TV or his phone, unless he hears a way to be your hero and do something that will make you happy. One woman was astonished, though, that when she simply said, I would love a glass of wine without any expectations, that within minutes, her husband was on the way to the store to go get her some. That's the power of expressing your desires in a way that inspires. Number four, keep it short. Keep it short. It's tempting to go into a long story about why you're thinking about whatever it is you want help with and what happened before and what your sister said and lots of other details. I know, I'm guilty of this too. If you want to express your desires in a way that inspires, consider keeping it short and sweet. Once you've expressed your appreciation for something that he does and figured out what it is that you want, construct one brief sentence. So it looks like this. I'm so grateful you put our son to bed every night. Can I borrow your brain about something? I'd love for him to clean his room, but it's not happening. What do you think? Then you can stop and listen to what he has to say. I promise he won't try to jump out the window this time. As far as whether to go along with his suggestions, that's up to you. You could continue to refine your desires as you go along. So if he says, okay, I'll tell him, I'll take him for ice cream after he cleans it, and you worry about your son having sugar or for a reward for doing his part, you could always say, I'd love to get into a routine that doesn't end with sweets. Another example is, hey, thanks for going to work every day to support us. Can I borrow your brain about something? I'd love to figure out some way for my mom to stay with us comfortably when she comes to visit. You might be surprised just how attentively and thoughtfully your husband listens when you use these techniques. If you're wondering how to get started with fixing your relationship and making it shiny again, then you need a roadmap. Get six simple steps to follow that will set your relationship up for success. Discover three common mistakes that wives make trying to fix their relationship that just make things worse. When you download my free Adored Wife Roadmap, you can do that at getcherished.com. Go to getcherished.com now to get your roadmap in minutes. My guest Sue had two failed marriages behind her, and despite her high hopes for her third marriage, she found they were often fighting, and she realized her husband didn't want to move forward with buying a house together, and she took that to mean he wasn't really in. Even marriage counseling didn't seem to help until the counselor gave her a post-it note that had a clue on it. Today, her marriage is loving, respectful, intimate, and comfortable, optimistic, She's going to tell us exactly how she created that. Welcome, Sue. Thanks for coming on the Empowered Wife podcast. Thank you, Laura. Thank you for inviting me. So start us off in the bad old days. What were things like in your relationship? You know, thank you, Laura. Um, you know, what, what the bad old days represented for me right off the get-go was that it was 
a mirror image of what I grew up with. And that's what I felt like we were going, we were heading towards that. And even though, you know, Greg and I, we couldn't seem to have conversations without turning it into an argument. And then we were, you know, we were newly married in our 50s. I married a 55-year-old bachelor, which, you know, back in the day before your Surrendered Singles book I read, um, that would have been a red flag. You know, oh, stay away from the 50, you know, older men that are bachelors. And so, but, you know, it was, it was so wonderful because he was a 55-year-old man that knew how self-sufficient he knew how to do his own dishes and do his own laundry and very very independent and and that I was attracted to right yeah but what was happening was I was seeing red flags it as we were getting closer and closer to our engagement closer and closer to our wedding date getting into the marriage I was starting to feel alone I was starting to um, question everything I had had chosen, my my prince. I had I was questioning it every single day because we couldn't get through one conversation without an argument. Wow. So so what was happening? So you would have like I remember you guys were were trying to buy a house, right? Yeah. Um, that's when the explosion pretty much happened. The <laughs> we were trying to buy a house, and I remember we were looking at this one certain house. And of course, as a woman, I fell in love with it the moment I walked into it and went, "Oh, this is such a cool house!" And oh, I just love it. And well, that instantly put a lot of pressure, which I didn't realize, put a lot of pressure on my husband. Because I was already saying yes to the house, and he hadn't done his due diligence and his research, and he was not there yet. And uh, we started the process, and he said, "Okay, well, if this is the house you want, then we'll go ahead and we'll we'll start the process." And so I started talking with the realtor, and then I started making the deal. And I started going, oh, well, they want to compromise and they want to come up with this. And so I, I was just running the show like I normally would because I was used to being an independent woman. And I didn't see anything wrong about it. I thought I was coming home and giving him the information on, oh, this is what I, this is what happened thus far. And he would just blow his stack. And I'd just be like, what? Why are you so angry at me? And I, I couldn't understand what, what am I doing that was causing him to be so frustrated and angry and, oh, it, it almost felt like verbal abuse to me. It was that bad. Did you start to think, okay, I know why this man's been a bachelor for 55 years. Like now I'm finding yes. out like this <laughs> didn't show up before. Now it's, right. now I can see now it. Now it's coming through right. loud and clear. Right. Yep. So another mistake really, right? Pick the wrong right. guy. Yeah. I was feeling like I had made a mistake. Yeah. yeah. And you were already married at this point or? Still yeah. Engaged, we were, or we were one year into, or less than a year, actually. We were into our first year. Supposed to be newlyweds, right? Right. <laughs> That's like... what the fairy tale story is, is that newlyweds the first year and Oh, everything's so wonderful, and mm -mm. you never hurt each other, right? Yeah, but you were getting hurt a lot. Yeah. It sounds like I was. So, what yeah. happened? Well, within a few days, um, I don't even know what our discussion was, but I remember him sitting at the dining room table, and he looking very frustrated and sad and angry and. And I remember I was standing in the living room and he just, all of a sudden, it was like, not all of a sudden, but he, he just was so serious. And he said, you know what? He goes, I just need you to know I'm falling out of love with you. And I told you I was going to be honest. If this wasn't going to work out, then I was going to be honest and tell you where I was at. It's a knife through your heart. Yeah, point. it was a really big knife, and it turned and turned. It wasn't just a stab; it it just went really deep. 
really deep. And Laura, I lost it. I lost it. I thought, okay, fine. You wanna, you want it? I'm gonna let it all out. And I just started screaming, and I just let everything out. I just sabotaged the whole, the whole thing. It was just, it, I turned into a, a really ugly monster. And then that I'm sure validated him because he was like, who is this person that's coming out? And I was just, I was just devastated. So totally devastated. And so he came and and we were arguing and I remember he walked towards the door and he said, you know what? I have to leave because I'm in fear of my life with you. And I'm like, what? So, yeah, he walked out the door and he said, I'm going to go sleep in my semi. Wow. Yeah. What better. a painful, painful experience. And, of course, as a mere mortal woman, you wanted him to hurt, too, right, when you were feeling so devastated. Yeah, I totally get that. I was attacking. So what yeah. happened? You know what I did is... I was desperate because I really, after he left, I cried and I cried and I cried and I didn't know how I was going to fix it. And so what I did to try and fix it was I called our pastor that married us and the next day. And I said, I need your help. You know, we were only nine months into our marriage at that time. And I said, I need your help. Um, we're, we're having a horrible, horrible thing happening. and. So he suggested going to a counselor and I was like, oh my gosh, you know, I just never imagined that I would be already seeking out professional help. And I did, I approached Greg and I said, I got a hold of, you know, our pastor and he suggested this person. Miraculously, he agreed. And I just thought, okay, there's some hope here. He agreed to go. So that was wonderful. And so we did go. And the most beautiful thing that came out of that story, Laura, <laughs> was the first the first meeting that we had with her. We had a few. But the first meeting we had with her, she had stuck a post-it note on some paperwork we were supposed to go through. And about four days after we had seen her, I finally pulled the paperwork out to start working on our homework and, of course, trying to get Greg to get on board with the homework, which he resisted. Um, It was, it said, read Laura Doyle, uh, Surrendered Wife. And I went, and I just, I remembered Laura. I remembered that, oh my gosh, Laura Doyle is the woman that that created the Surrendered Singles book, which is why I was here in the first place, because that is how I met Greg, was by going through the Surrendered Singles book and, and rediscovering or, or finally self-discovering myself and understanding that I have desires and that I want wants and that I did want to get married again. It was hard after having two failed marriages I was not wanting to have men in my life. So, but yet I was horribly lonely and knew that it was what God wanted me to, to have in my life. Wow. Was a marriage. A that is beautiful. Marriage. I want to pause on that for a second because it does take a lot to find your faith again. Yeah. After those two divorces had to be pretty painful too. Painful. And uh, so it really, it took a lot. But so I just admire that about you, Sue, that you found the courage to try again yeah. yeah okay so you found this little post-it note what happened well I instantly ran out to the local bookstore and found the one and only book on the shelf <laughs> and I instantly bought it and I ran back home and I started reading and reading and reading and reading and Laura your story connected me it it was like reading about myself and what really stuck out the most were the two things that I needed to really, I think, focus on, which was respect, respect for my husband, not understanding what respect meant 
And the other one is relinquishing control because I was such an independent woman and I had so many fears that I didn't realize I had. So many fears that I I had trouble with trust. And I didn't trust my husband is what I found once I started working the skill. Wow. And so this kind of gave you a new pair of perspectives, it sounds like. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. It opened the door wide open. Let me give you an example. One of the times um, when it came to the respect, I we were looking at a new house. We were going forward again. We had been going to the counselor for a few times. Uh, we got to a point of three or four visits, and she wasn't taking us to where we wanted. And uh, so we kind of fired her. And I said, you know what? I I found something new. And I think I told Greg, I said, I think I know that I can I can help our marriage. I I know what I need to do. So we went ahead and we started moving forward. And we were it was after a marriage counseling session. We were sitting in the car. He was telling me he was talking to me and saying, what is it that can make you happy? Because I can't seem to make you happy. And he goes, what is it? Will this house make you happy? If, if we get this house, will that make you happy? And in my head, Laura, I just kept hearing, he's not wanting to commit. He's, we're back at it again. He doesn't want to commit. He's afraid of, afraid of commitment. He was, he was going to crush my dreams again my dreams of moving forward with this relationship. It was, he was, he was spilling out his honest truth, but it was hard to hear. It was really painful to hear. And, but I did, I went, you know what, honey, I hear you. And then I just zipped my lip, put on the duct tape. And he went, thank you. Laura, that was my biggest aha moment in my life, because what I realized right then and there was I was never validating his thoughts, his ideas, and I was always shoving my own opinion because of my fear. I was always shoving my own opinion right back at him, and I was never listening, never truly listening to him because of my fears stopping me. Wow, incredible. So you created a an incredible moment of intimacy right there, it, it sounds did. like. It did. And and a validation for me. It was that again, an aha validation that, oh my gosh, I have not been listening to him. Wow. Yeah. So my my favorite my favorite cheat phrase is I hear you. <laughs> It's a good one, isn't it? Oh, it saves a marriage. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, again, just that one phrase. I love it. So what, and what's your relationship like now? How long have you been married, Sue? We have now been married seven, yeah, seven years. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. And, what, and what's your relationship like? Oh, you know, I, Laura, I had to, I, I just, while I was working on this, while I was thinking about this, Laura, I I wanted to ask my husband because I thought it's the most important thing to find out what he thinks. You know, what do you think? And so I did. I asked him, I said, well, where, where do you think, you know, what, where's our marriage? You know, what is our marriage like today? And he said, it's loving. It's respectful. It's comfortable. It's intimate. And it's really optimistic. And wow, I mean, those words were music to my ears because I was getting it right from the prince's mouth and really hearing that that's truly how he feels about our marriage right now. And so do I. And it's, it, it's wonderful. And we're, we're dealing with things. We're a team and, and things are, are moving forward beautifully. I love that. And just for, uh, as a point of reference to you, you two are quarantined together right now, right? So, and and you're used to him being gone. I am. I am. He's an over the road truck driver. So 
he, when we first started this, um, you know, seven years ago, his job, he was gone Monday and sometimes Sunday through Saturday, a lot of times. And it was a really, really challenging, it's, it's a challenging world being a trucker's wife. Mm-hmm. It, and, um, but the skills that they, they helped me survive and they helped me find myself and they helped me delve into self care. They helped me find gratitude every day. And it, I just, every day I'm able to, you know, it's okay. He's on the road. He's, he's a provider. He's doing a great job. Oh, I love that. And, and now he's home because again, I was vulnerable. I allowed myself to be vulnerable with this scare that is going on. And he said, well, I'll tell you what, he goes, I'm going to write to my boss. And he said, I'm in no condition to be on the road because of my medical conditions. And he said, I'm going to stay home. And I was just like, oh my gosh. So we're home together and it's going beautiful. Oh my gosh. And you're, so you're not at each other's throats or getting mm-hmm. kind of testy. I mean, that can happen too, right? If it's a, a new situation where suddenly you're thrown together 24-7. Yeah. Um, so because you're working from home, home now too, right? Yes, I am. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh. So if a woman, so there's a woman listening right now, I'm sure she is, who says, wow, I'm in the same boat as Sue where it just seems like everything's a fight. And what I really want is to have a loving, respectful, comfortable marriage where I feel optimistic. How, what's, how do I get there? What's your best tip? You know, I would say the best thing is just in the get go, be willing. Be willing and open for change because that alone, become aware of your what's going on around you, but be willing and open and, and take a baby step, take a baby step from your fear, you know, identify your fear of what's going on inside you in your feminine spirit and just allow yourself to take one baby step to finding happiness to finding a way to help yourself and to come on board with this community of like-minded women because I have never in my whole entire life have ever found a community of sisterhood that treats me so beautifully and doesn't judge me and allows me to be me and allows me to uncover my blind spots when it's time for me to find that blind spot. And it just, and it encourages me and empowers me and makes me accountable. So I would just say, be willing and open. And what's a, what's a good baby step for her to take? Mm. Well, find Laura Doyle. (laughs) However, however it is, look, Look Laura Doyle up. Um, Read my story out there, you know, because I have a story out there. All of us coaches have stories out there. Um, Just get connected somehow, some way. Get connected to Laura Doyle. Just feel the empowerment. So if you could go back now and talk to yourself from before, what would you say to Sue of that time? Oh, wow. You know, don't be so hard on yourself. So um, find your inner child and go have fun. And don't, you know, just don't worry about the small stuff because it's the small stuff that can get you in trouble. <laughs> it can, yeah. it can. And, and, um, and how does being a coach, how does that impact your relationship with Greg? You know, it, it's the most selfless thing. It, it's it's the most servicing thing that I could probably do in my life, which is to help other women and just share my testimonial. That is that is our ultimate goal in life is to just share our experiences, share our testimonials, and share our hope, because this 
is hope. And this, my marriage, I didn't think I was going to be able to save my marriage. I mean, I didn't see any hope in the beginning. And now I have, the other thing is my confidence that this works. There's a certain confidence a woman gets from, from just working these skills and just, just finding herself. It's, it's powerful. And so it sounds like your relationship is now a source of strength. It is. is that fair? Yeah. It's, like a, it really is. It, it's a, it's a place of strength and comfort. Yeah. yeah. You feel loved every day. That does give you confidence, doesn't it? And yeah, did you ever think you'd be celebrating seven years married in that first? No, life? no, I, I really didn't. And and I'm, what I really want to celebrate is uh, there's even more. There's more than seven years, and, and I can confidently yes. say that. But yeah. this is not the end. This is this is no. my husband always was saying in the beginning. I just want to have a fairy tale wedding. I want to have a fairy tale marriage. And I would always be putting him off going, that is just not realistic. You know, marriages, we fight all the time. That that's just normal. Fighting in a marriage is normal. And it's like to have have that lie in my head be taken away because of your work has been the greatest um aha moment. And the greatest gift that you could have given me, Laura. Thank you. Sue, I give you all the credit for having the courage and the willingness to do do the stuff. So just try experiments in your relationship. Like I hear you and finding your your goddess of fun and light, your inner child, and um, making yourself happy. So this yeah. has been super inspiring. Thanks for sharing so um, so intimately with us. These are very personal matters that you're sharing, and uh, it's it's just a huge gift. So thank you so much. Thank you, Laura. Thank you for helping other women. If you're wondering how to get started with fixing your relationship and making it shiny again, then you need a roadmap. Get six simple steps to follow that will set your relationship up for success. Discover three common mistakes that wives make trying to fix their relationship that just make things worse. When you download my free Adored Wife Roadmap, you can do that at GetCherished.com. Go to GetCherished.com now to get your roadmap in minutes. And now it's time for the Worst Relationship Advice of the Week Award. It's the Worst Relationship Advice of the Worst Relationship Advice. Yeah, it's the Worst Relationship Advice of the Worst Relationship Advice of the Week. And the advice that's got me dismayed this week was sent to me by a thoughtful listener. And it's the advice that you can improve your relationship by learning your love language and your husband's love language. And what I love about you sending this in to me, adorable listener, is that this advice is so popular. It's part of the lexicon now to talk about your love language. Just about everyone has heard about love languages, and yet it didn't help her and it didn't help me. But why didn't it? What's wrong with taking the quiz and figuring out what makes you feel loved and then what makes him feel loved and focusing on that? Well, to quote the wise listener who sent this in, while it is great to know that you can show love in different ways, most of us focus on how we are not getting the love we need in our own love language, while your husband may be showing it in some other way. Better to focus on gratitude and relinquishing control. In other words, This is just one more way that control may be hurting your relationship, and there's a much more effective way to have him respond better to you. I've also had students share about feeling stuck, that her husband is insisting that she just do what she knows is his love language, and she feels pressured, but also unwilling to give it to him. And I can see why, because now it's your chore, it's your duty to do acts of service for him or give him physical touch, even if you don't feel like doing it. So you're going to give so you can get. 
which is never very fulfilling. You have another burdensome duty along with the school carpool runs, buying groceries. It's, it's just, it was just another thing for them to fight about. I remember someone asking me once what my love language was a few years ago. And I said, you know, I love having them all. And today I definitely feel I do get loved in every way. But it wasn't by figuring out a particular favorite way and then telling my husband to do it. I tried that already. It never got me what I wanted. And if I can get loved in all my love languages, then I figure you can too, right? If it works for me, if it works for so many other women, why not you? So for that reason, the advice that you need to figure out your love languages as a couple and give them to each other is the worst relationship advice I've heard all week. Thanks for sending me the worst relationship advice of the week. If you hear some terrible relationship advice and send it to me, you could get an anonymous shout out on my show. Be sure to listen and subscribe to the Empowered Wife podcast. Next week, we'll talk about how to stop his emotional abuse. I hope you're having lots of fun because that is so important. Today's fun fact is that Groundhog Day is one of my favorite movies. I watch it over and over and over and over. Thank you.